So today we are going to look at the May June 2017 Principles of Business Paper 2 past paper. Okay, so we, we, it's, it's May June 2017 Paper 2 to hours. Okay, so let's just jump right into it. Question one. Okay, answer all questions. Question one. Define each of the following terms. So you have enterprise, you have entrepreneurship. Okay, you have enterprise and entrepreneurship, and you can see it's four max. So you give me a little one or two sentences. All right, so what is an enterprise? What's an entrepreneurship? Now, an enterprise is another name for a business. Okay, but I don't think you'll get two marks for that. So you may have to go a little deeper than that one. So there are many definitions for enterprise. So let's just look at some of them. Okay, this one is one I, I, I am leaning towards. A company organized for commercial purposes, business or business firm. Again, so an enterprise, a company organized for commercial purposes, business or firm. That's another name of it. All right. So our next definition, our next nice one, entrepreneurial activity, especially when accompanied by initiative and resourcefulness. Okay, let's go again. Entrepreneur, entrepreneurial activity, especially when accompanied by initiative and resourcefulness. That's, that's a next definition of an enterprise. Another one is this one, a project or undertaking that is especially difficult and complicated or risky. So this one is a more broad one, so it's not really business related. But this one, a unit of economic organization or activity. So this one with business in it, a unit of economic organization or activity. So for the exam, I would go with this one, a company organized for commercial purposes, a firm, a business or firm, simple as that. Okay. Entrepreneurship. <clears throat> so we know what, the, what an entrepreneur is. An entrepreneur is a person who takes the calculated risk to start a business. So entrepreneurship now, now entrepreneur is a noun. So the entrepreneurship is the act of doing it. Okay. Entrepreneurship is the act of doing it. So it's the act of, is all the activities involved in, involved such as taking a risk to start, uh, well, a calculated risk to start a business. All right, let's look at this. Look at this. The activities of setting up a business or businesses taking on financial risk in hopes of a profit. So that's a definition right there of entrepreneurship. The activity of setting up a business or businesses taking on financial risk in the hope of a profit. So it's the, it's, 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 it's the activities is doing it. All right, it's the activities doing it. So the activity of setting up a business or businesses taking on a financial risk in the hopes of profit. Now the key word there is risk. Okay. So an entrepreneur, an entrepreneur is normally a risk taker. So that's the, those are the answers for these two. Going down. B. State two economic benefits and two social benefits of a business to the community in which it is located. All right. So clearly, economic benefits would be, of course, jobs, okay? The business would create jobs. And next economic benefit would be, of course, it would, on a, on a macro level, it can bring in new taxes, generate new taxes for the government. So that's two right there. Create jobs for, you know, people in the community and also provide a, a more taxes to the government so that, you know, they can in turn spend to help in you know education whatever so those are two economic benefits of starting the business all right so it is jobs and of course bringing in got new revenue for the government in our, our the whatever the local authority local government whatever so it's going to bring in more generate more tax revenues okay social benefit would include things like the company the business in the community now giving back to the community Right? They might sponsor somebody in the community. They might be able to, you know, adopt an area in the community, keep it nice and clean. Also, when you have a, a business, a business in a community, there's a trickle down effect where, you know, workers, like for example, if a school is in a in a in a community, a lot of businesses pop pop up around that school, and therefore, you know, everything trickle down. So you have the school, you supply the school, you hire somebody. Because of that. You're going to buy more stuff from the supplier. So the supplier is going to get more business and it trickles right around the economy. So social benefit includes things like, like, you know, 
sponsoring the the, the, the community uh bringing a, a, a new a different identity to the community so the community might might have been maybe stagnant or something but when you have a, a business in the community you might bring an, a new identity to that community you know people are gathering based on the type of business people will be able to gather around socialize in that area because of the business if it's a restaurant a shop you know that might, might be the place to go and talk and meet and stuff like that also social benefit it gives the community access to a wider variety of goods right whatever it is they're creating if it's a new shop then you have a diff you have access to a next variety you know different variety of things so it opens up the, the base it gives them access to a wide variety of things all right so no they're not stuck with just one small area they have choices also it can stimulate competition so that you know it can that might that's more of an economic benefit too all right economic benefit it can stimulate co uh, competition with larger firms to help you to get a more reasonable a reasonable uh price for your goods all right so social benefit is more how we affect the, the community on a social level you know sponsorships you know um make the place looking a little a little nicer that's you know help the environment because they you know my character plant a tree campaign or something like that you know make it a hub for people to come and talk you know come and hang come and hang and stuff like that to socialize that kind of stuff is the social benefits of the business and economic is more you know money you know jobs more tax revenue competition all right um identify two stakeholders of a business and explain the role of each two stakeholders so who are stakeholders now stakeholders are anyone who is affected by the operations of the business so that, that includes members of the community the government the work the employer the employees the owners all those are stakeholders in a business anybody that is affected by the operation of the business is called a stakeholder so identify two stakeholders of a business and explain the role of each so if you are going to say the employees they are stakeholders yes so their role would be of course to carry out their duties to work in the in the in the business and to you know help the company to generate whatever profits they can so their main role would be to work in the company and help it to reach whatever goals they have to achieve that's if you, see, if you choose employers employees sorry if you, see, if you choose employers their role would be of course to you know hire people pay them a decent wage um allow them to work decent hours keep the business afloat make sure you have maximum return on the investment of the business so their main role would be to make sure the business is flourishing okay if you choose the government of course the government is a stakeholder their role would be to regulate the business and make sure that they are doing things the right things make sure they are abiding by the laws the rules and the regulation if you say society then society's job would be to the community their job would be to keep the business you know keep the business honest keep them responsible hold them accountable for environmental issues for you know giving back to the community don't just take 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 so that would be the role of the society if they were chosen as a stakeholder so you can identify two you can have employer employee government the community that kind of thing the owner those are all stakeholders in a business all right added to those i mentioned you have other stakeholders in a business all right we mentioned the employees we mentioned the owner we mentioned the government we mentioned the community there's also of course the customers okay the customers and the suppliers now the customers role of course is to support the business in the best way they can you know patronize the the, the establishment so that they can you know earn revenue earn profit and of course the suppliers is their role as it says is to make sure that there is a decent distribution channel there's a decent supply chain available to the business so that they can maximize their profitability okay so stakeholders benefit if a business succeeds stakeholders suffer if a business fails business promotes good relations with their stakeholders okay all right, so that's the answer for that one all right so moving on describe two challenges that a business could encounter when trying to satisfy its ethical role in the community okay 
outlined two challenges the business outlined two challenges that the business could encounter when trying to satisfy its ethical role in the community of course some of the ethical issues that the the business has to deal with is things like advertising taxation uh, the environment among others okay so those are ethical issues yeah so yes yeah, so some of the ethical issues as you can see on the screen tax environment advertising standards money laundering so those are some ethical issues now the question asks describe two challenges that the business could encounter when trying to satisfy its ethical role in the community okay now let's go what challenge would be advertising okay that could be a challenge that the business can encounter when trying to satisfy its ethical role in the community now they expect the business to advertise you know you know family friendly nice nice way that a clean you know way of advertising but some companies might be tempted to go the route of false advertising or smear campaigns against the rivals or something like that you know sometimes you see a commercial on tv about the rival brand you know they don't want to put any name there so they just say the rival brand and so you keep your hands clean that's still you know fair play but if you go and call name and go against a company go against a rival in your the, in the advertisement that can be a challenge to the community okay because you are putting out false advertising out there so that's not good you might end up putting advertising toward to children that's not a good thing you might and then the flip side is that maybe those kind of advertisement might work you know raunchy clickbait you know sex sales kind of advertising that might work that might get you you know the the the, the money you need but now you have to go and decide is that worth it is that that's what ethic, ethics is all about good versus bad is, is that really illegal versus legal it's just like good versus bad so advertising is an ethical issue that can be challenging because one as that might work might not be on the you know too ethical the ones that might be cleaner family friendly might not be too effective so you might have a little you know issue there as it relates to advertising and next one of course is tax you might have your taxes to pay right and you know taxes would be used by the government to help communities help the nation on a whole so if you choose to evade your tax or dodge your tax you know the taxes or file taxes inappropriately or look for tax loopholes now that's a problem because now you are taking away from the community you're not really giving back to the community in an indirect way you're taking from the community because you choose to go and you know use the tax loopholes evade the taxes not pay them at all so that's unethical and that would in turn affect your community all right so that could be a problem that they could encounter you know you see a lot of money and then they tell you that the vat or or the corporate tax is so high you don't want to give away all your profits so you, you try to dodge and hide the tax somewhere take it out of the community put it offshore stuff like that now that can be an issue within the community taken away from the community okay and of course the environment that's a direct issue that's a direct ethical issue whatever your business is you might be polluting the environment you know you might be able to buy maybe if you're producing something in a factory you might be able to buy those you know filters to prevent the smoke from going up but you chose not to because you know it's too expensive and you don't want to spend any money so that could be a problem you might encounter you know in the community you might be polluting the community you might dispose of your waste inappropriately put them in a river put them in a in a, in a nice park or somewhere so you're messing with the overall beauty of the community now okay so that might be that's another problem i encounter the environment you might end up you know destroying the environment destroying the community which is not a good thing all right so that's not a good thing and of course the la the other one there is money laundering okay so you might have some thugs in the community and you choose to you know support them wash the money for them and then that would have a certain bad bad actors within the community that could be a problem for the community so you don't want to do that that's unethical okay so those are some of the you can go to town with this six max so it's you know two two of them you put about half half each and you can write a lot about those things so those are the ethical issues that businesses encounter you can go and choose and dissect and you know open it up okay use a common sense to answer that question so that would be the end of number one number two state two activities performed by each of the following managers 
to activities performed by each of the following managers. They ask to simply state for Mac, so brap brap one two one two. Okay, so the marketing manager, what do they do? Marketing manager controls, you know, market research. They are the ones who control the marketing budget. They are the ones who would control the ads, the type of ads. Those are the ones who would control the sales promotions. Those are the ones who would control, you know, going and doing the focus groups. Those are the ones who, you know, basically find ways to get the product from the producer to the hands of the consumer. That's what marketing is. All the processes and the systems that you use to get the product from the producer into the hands of the consumer. So think about that as a marketing manager. You have to be able to think about, you know, new campaigns, new ad campaigns. You have to think about new ways to promote the product. New sales promotion, you know, buy one, get one free, samples, you know, things like that. You have to conduct market research. You have to go and observe, go and do questionnaires, go and do surveys. All those things you're going to be responsible for as, as the marketing managers. Okay, so that's marketing. Now, production, of course, production, clearly, you have to produce the good. You're the one in charge of making the product, producing the good or the service. That's production, making the, the product. You also have to, you know, up, obtain the resources needed to produce the goods. So as the marketing manager, you have to go and seek the raw materials and things like that to go and get the goods. So you have to seek the raw materials, you know, get the supply chain running for your raw materials, those kind of things. So anything involved in producing the good, that would be the job of the production officer or the production manager, you know, to procure the goods, the raw materials, to actually carry out overseeing the production of the good you know you have to manage the line manage your 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 um your assembly lines those kind of things you have to go and inspect the product when it's done all those things so as a production manager all those things are things you have to look into and of course this again is common sense you are in a production department you're producing the goods so you have to think about activities that you are in charge of as the one making and producing the good before and after, even for storage and those kind of things. The good is finished. You have to look into storage of the goods and things like that, warehousing and those kind of things. All right. So, yeah, so those are marketing and production. Uh, distinguish between finance and human resource areas of a business. Finance and human resource area of a business. This is a strange question. Distinguish. How do you. This is obvious. This is the obvious difference between these two. All right, because the finance deals with the money in the business. All right, deals with the accounts, the money, how the company is going to make the money, how they're going to spend the money, how they're going to allocate funds, how they're going to budget the money. That's what the finance does. Whereas human resource, HR, is responsible for staffing, responsible for training, responsible for any grievances filed, you know, on behalf of the workforce those kind of things so finance deals with the monetary aspect of the business you know the money the budget the revenue the income the expenditure all the thing that's finance whereas human resource deal with the people these are the people within the business they are the ones who hire staffing they're the ones who train they're the ones who recruit they're the ones who you make your complaints to they're the ones who put regulations in place to guide how humans interact within the business the parameters of the business so this is a very simple one to differentiate distinction between these two all right so we're not going to spend too much time on that one describe each of the following functions of management okay so we have delegating motivating coordinating okay very simple delegating now to delegate means to give authority to someone to do something okay so if you're a manager when you're delegating a task, that means that you as the manager are giving someone below you the authority to carry out a task on your behalf, in a sense. That's delegating. So you don't want to be micromanaging. You don't want to be doing everything yourself as a manager. No. You say, okay, you, you can do this. You, you can do this. That's delegating. Giving the task, giving others authority to complete certain tasks, to carry out certain tasks. That's delegating as a, as, as a manager. Motivating. Of course, is as it was as as you know what motivating means. Motivating is where the manager helps to keep the morale of his workers high. Okay, how it helps to bring up and maintain the morale of 
his workforce, keep them engaged, keep them wanting to come back, keep them, you know, hyped to come back to work. That's what motivating is all about. Some people are motivated by different means, some, you know, by money, some by getting, you know, empowered, being empowered. Various things motivate people. But management needs to have a way to engage the workers, keep them engaged, keep them wanting to come, keep them hyped about the job, keep them excited about the job, keep morale high in the organization. So that's what motivating is all about. Now, coordinating now, as a manager, coordinating means you have to bring different areas together to work as one. Okay, so you have to coordinate, you have to bring complex operations together to operate as one, to work as one. So, in the case of a manager, let's say you have, you know, a finance department, you have a production department, you have an HR department. Now, the manager have to bring all of those, the, the, the big boss, the general manager have to bring all of those under one, you know, as one unit work together as one unit to achieve the goals of the company so that's coordinating they have to um, bring this one in line with this one and that one in line with that one so production in line with sales in line with marketing in line with finance so that everybody can work together as one unit one organization one business to achieve the, a common goal so that's coordinating right there all right explain one way in which management fulfills is, is responsibility to each of the following okay good so this is about the responsibilities of management to em customers, employees. Okay, so let's go. Customers. Now, the responsibility of management towards customers is simple. You have to give them uh, good, good conditions to conduct business in. Okay, as a customer, you want to be able to be conducting business in a clean, hygienic, a good work, good environment to conduct business. That's one. You know, make sure the environment is conducive to conduct in business. Also, customers, you have to supply customers with quality goods at a decent price. Okay, you don't want to give them shoddy goods, you know, low quality goods, and you don't want to do any price gouging. You don't want to dig out the eyes. You don't want to charge them too much. So you want to charge customers a reasonable price for a quality goods. For quality goods, that's those. That's three responsibilities they outlined for management to consumers. A good environment to conduct work quality product good or service and also decent price okay you can also say a timely in a timely manner you don't want to be waiting too long you don't want to be you know expect waiting months for anything to happen so you want your goods in a timely manner customers now as it is employees similar to customers management must ensure that employees have a decent salary work decent hours that's the responsibilities decent good salary good hours and good working environment you don't want a toxic working environment so management is responsible to ensure that the employees are not working in a toxic environment so that's both in terms of atmosphere and in, and in both and physically you don't want to be working in a physically dangerous environment okay so you have to make sure that you know you have proper ventilation you have good working machinery that kind of thing so that's management responsible to the employees make sure they have a good quality work environment both you know in terms of the atmosphere the, the vibe in the workplace and also physically you have to make sure you have a physically safe environment to work in also you have to make sure you pay your employees what they deserve you pay them their money and make sure they work their proper hours so you have to go by law the labor follow the labor laws in terms of working hours and in terms of monies all right the other management responsibilities but the acts one i gave you three okay so that's it for question two Question three now. List three examples of, of, of technologies used by businesses. Now, this is very simple. List three computer, internet, cell phones, uh, what else? I mean, that's three right there computer, internet, cell phones. What else can you get? Vehicles, uh, the, um, high tech machinery. All those are, are technologies used by businesses today. Okay, if you if you want to get more specific and look at the computer, you have various apps, you have various um, applications, you have various things like you know your Excel, your Word, your um, computer aided designs, you know your graphical interfaces, you have your Photoshop or whatever. All right, if you want to get specific again, you have your cell phone, you have various apps on your cell phones, you have the internet, you have the intranet even, 
okay you want to get more specific you're talking about you know dropbox or something like that you know outlook all those things all right so this is a very easy question you don't have to, to waste too long too much time on this list three example of technology used by businesses all of us are part of the digital age so we understand technology okay so it might be something like a commercial size you know a, a, fry, a deep fryer or maybe a commercial size microwave maybe a, a wood whatever just technology in general you're gonna think of three examples and go to town on this one three max one two three outline two ways in which technology may be used to enable businesses to grow so i don't even have to go too deep in this one because this is a more common sense question okay two ways technology may use a business to grow of course you can use internet you can use social media you can use all those things to improve you know marketing to acquire new equipment from people far away you know build networking you know stay in contact with new suppliers cheaper suppliers those kind of things you can open up new markets you know you you, you are work you are just supplying for your country but now you can export because now technology allows you to be able to track your packages trace the packages allow them to reach in a faster time because planes are faster you know that kind of stuff so this one is a very common sense one how technology can be used to enable business to grow okay so growth includes both external internal internal growth meaning you acquire new equipment you know more up-to-date equipment you hire more people also external growth includes opening new branches new outlets exploring new markets all right internal you can also expand your product line you know start doing different things so this one is a very simple straightforward question we don't have to spend too much time on this one kill that all right list three functions of a small business three functions of a small business okay very simple again small business provide jobs provide goods or services to our community provides a uh, foreign exchange provides added tax revenue to the government so that's just four functions of a small business right there okay so again function of a small business provide jobs provide increased uh, tax revenue also it helps to stimulate competition among different you know with the big boys you know similar competition with the big boys and so this one is again very simple you just you just list them one to three function of a small business and you go all right so that's very straightforward very simple and of course on top of all those functions uh business is there to make a profit that's the ultimate goal okay that's the ultimate function of a business is to make a profit okay so provide goods services employment profit all those things are listed functional areas of a business all right good next one state two challenges and two benefits associated with the growth of a business okay state two challenges and two benefits associate associated with the growth of a business would be things like uh, lack of capital all right inability to raise capital that's a challenge to a business growing our uh, competition there might be stiff competition out there among competitors so therefore you might not be able to grow as efficiently as you would have liked and also there are other challenges that they, they can face such as straight up lack of resources okay so let's go so three challenges right there inability inability to raise capital competition from you know other rivals lack of resources also the lack of market you know you might have tapped out the market so you can grow into a new market so those are challenges that can those are four challenges that you can face as it relates to growth all right Diffic benefits of growth of course clear benefit of growth would be what you call economies of scale economies of scale economies of, economies of scale is where you get certain advantages by growing as a business one such advantage would be the ability to buy things in bulk that's an advantage for being bigger our next benefit would be the fact that you have more access to finance because banks think it hard to really lend you know some small businesses a certain amount of money but as they start to grow the banks see that and now you have the ability to you know get more financing our next one would be of course 
increasing in profits if you're growing you're producing more so therefore your, your profits should increase all right so that's three benefits right there economy economies of scale meaning that you have certain advantages for growing big such as you know you, you can buy in bulk um increase access to finance you know banks are more willing to lend a bigger company more money and increasing profits again all right so that's the next part from a next one from good increasing profits there are others out there but you know that's just true to get you started you can think about the others all right see explain two ways in which growth of a business affects its organizational structure okay let's go so remember the organizational structure our chat shows you know who is who is in charge of what all the workers within an organization and where they are placed so two things that comes out from this chat is what i call the span of control and the chain of command now if a business begins to grow then the chain of command and the span of, of control can become more complicated more complex okay you might have had a narrow span of control before meaning you know one boss is in charge of maybe two or three persons but as the business grow your span of control might widen so all of a sudden one person in charge of maybe seven or eight su supervisors so that happens when the business grow organizational structure wise then you have the same thing with the chain of command where as the business grow all of a sudden you don't even know who your real boss is right you got your boss of your boss of your boss so you are you know you're rank and file you are entry level person you answer to one person you don't even know that that one person answer to a next answer to a next answer to a next okay because i'm pretty sure people who work in google or microsoft they don't even know you know maybe that Satya Nudella is their boss they don't even answer to him because he's the ceo but he's so far up the organizational structure that somebody way down don't even know who the boss is they don't even have any communication with the boss right so so it affects the span of control Yes, it affects the chain of command. It also affects communication within a business because now communication can be more complex. All right, you might get two different messages from two different bosses. You don't know which one to answer to, so that might mess up the communication as the, you know, the the the, the, the business starts to grow. Okay, so the key things to the key takeaways here is that it affects the span of control, chain of command. They become more complex communication also becomes more complex everything becomes more complex as the business begins to grow so define the term brand name define the term brand name now a brand name is a name given to a product or a product line a group of, a group or groups of products by a manufacturer okay it's a name given to a, a product or a line of product by a manufacturer for example you have brand names like Jordan. You have brand names like Samsung. You have brand names like Apple. You have Surface, those kind of things. So a brand name is a, it's often sometimes a unique name sometimes, but a brand name is a name given to a product or a set of products by or service by a manufacturer or the owner of that product gives a name, gives a name. Okay. Um, identify two forms of packaging identify two forms of packaging so you have basically three forms of packaging you have primary packaging you have secondary packaging and you have tertiary packaging now primary packaging is the packaging when for the like the individual unit for example if you are buying let's say uh, let's say chewing gum the small ones in the smallest form would be primary packaging the individual one that is packed with the primary packaging now secondary packaging would be the bigger box that the smaller ones come in and then tertiary packaging would be the big crate that all of them came in that was shipped in that's tertiary packaging that's more like bulk packaging okay and of course packaging you have different types of packaging you have you know cardboard you have your vacuum seal plastic you have your styrofoam you have you know various different um materials are used for packaging okay you have your bottles you have your glass you have different things but you have your primary secondary tertiary packaging all right state two purpose of packaging of course very simple very straightforward two purposes of packaging one for convenience you know so that the customers can hold the product properly hold it good so for convenience that's one two for information you know the package will contain a lot of information your name the brand name of the product how it should be used nutritional facts all that kind of thing so that's another purpose of pack then of course you also have 
apart from convenience, you have protection. All right, packaging keeps goods fresh, protect them from damage. That's obvious. You package them to stay fresh and from getting damaged. And of course, design. Packaging is there. One of the first things that you see in a product is its package. So that can help to attract, you know, display the brand name, attract the buyer to that package, to that product. If it's beautifully packed, you might be tempted to go and even just buy just for the beautiful packaging. Okay, so you have four areas here for benefits, for reasons for packing, you know, for purposes for packing. Again, the four purposes are protection, convenience, design, and for information, informative purposes. So that's that for packaging. Describe two techniques used in selling. So you have a whole slew. For example, you have discounts. Okay, you can give somebody a discount if they come and buy something. So you offer maybe a 50% discount, buy one, get one off, that kind of stuff. So discount selling is one technique used in selling. So it's four marks, so you have to explain how discounts work. Then you have things like, we have advertising, for sure. That's a technique for selling. You have ads to promote your goods, to promote your products. So advertising is another way of getting your product sold because it gives you the people information, the customers information about your product and entices them to come and take part in it. So you have advertising, you have discounts, you also have tests, all right, samples. You can give out samples and if they like the sample, then the person can end up, you know, coming back and buying the product. So those are different techniques in getting the product sale. Those are part of what we call sales promotions. So right here, you have a list of various sale promotions. Okay, so sale promotions, an activity designed to boost the sales of products or services. It may include an advertising campaign, as you said earlier. Increase public relations activities that, you know, you go out and do things to get recognized, you know, publicity stunts and stuff like that. A uh, free sample, okay, so give, like I said, a giveaway. A sample and if they like it they come back offering free gifts or trading stamps so you say buy one get this gift free you know or, or arrange for demonstrations or exhibitions so that's a way of getting your stuff out there promoting sales setting up competitions with attractive prices temporary price reductions door-to-door -door calling telephone selling personal letters so all these are various sales promotions so that's that would be the answers to cover all of this describe two techniques but you have to as i said describe so it's four max, so you don't have to just list. So you just, you just can't write advertising. You have to go in depth, describe what you mean by advertising, what do you mean, billboards, movies, you know, whatever. So you have to go in depth with this one. If you say discounts, I'll buy one, get one free, you say that, you know, the customers might be selling shoes, the, the business selling shoes, and they might offer a BOGO. Look at Pellets. Pellets often have the BOGO, buy one, get one off. Those kind of things. So you have to describe it, not just list it, okay? Outline two methods which vendors can employ to promote sales. Or two methods which vendors can employ to promote sales. So down here now, you might get a little bit more specific. Okay, so up here you're talking about describe two techniques used in selling. So in general, two techniques used, you know, advertising, discounts, those things. But down here, you have to outline two methods which vendors employ to promote sales. So, you know, the giveaways and the buy one, get one free and those things. So you have to be more specific down here. You have to outline it, how it works down here. Up here, a little more general. All right, describe the methods, but down here, you, you go in depth as how, as how it works. You have to be more specific with this one. All right. Explain two ways in which exist, the existence of copyright is likely to influence the actions of producers and consumers. Okay, this one might be a little tricky. All right, let's go. So, what is a copyright? Now, a copyright is a way in which a person uh, claim to their intellectual property. Okay, your intellectual property. So, intellectual property include things like, you know, movies, software, songs, games, those kind of things. That's intellectual property. Poems, books, that's intellectual property. So copyright is normally for books and those kind of things. All right, so two ways in which the existence of copyright is likely to influence the actions of producers and consumers, meaning that consumers now would have to think twice before they steal from somebody's work because the copyright means that you cannot just freely use somebody thing without giving asking for permission or in case of school and things like that you have to give reference so if you're writing a paper you have to give reference to okay i got this quote from this book because it's a copyrighted it's copyrighted so you have to give reference so when as it is to the producers now 
the producers can now use that intellectual property to make money okay so they can use it they can get royalties you see uh, an uh, advertisement and here uh, you see something being used from a movie or a so as you can see forms of intellectual properties you have copyright and you have books music creative works okay books music creative that's the that includes movies too so now producers can leverage this their intellectual property for example if you want to make an ad and you want to use the music from a from a, a song from somebody you have to go and ask permission and then you have to pay them to use that song you have to pay them what is called royalties so everything that ad plays they get something from it so the producers can get from that okay and also if you're using it without permission they can go and sue you so that they can claim damages so you have to pay them back for that so the producer can sue you or uh, they can leverage it and and get money from it but the consumer now will have to reference or ask permission to use whatever intellectual properties out there again i said if you, you have textbooks if you're writing a quotation you have to put who the quotation is from you know from which books you have to reference that book uh if you're using music or something like for example on youtube you cannot just use copyrighted music you have to use royalty free music because you have to pay for people you have to pay to use people's properties so that's the, so that's how copyright would influence the actions of producers and consumers all right so the producers can use their property intellectual property to get money they can sue because you know you can't use it just like that consumers they can use uh they have to ask permission and they have to source where they get the information from okay so you have to go to tone on that one all right question five so number five define the term standard of living okay so let's look at standard of living for a quick second right here standard of living and quality and versus quality of life so let's go standard of living standards are measured a measure of how well people live okay it's your it's your well-being it's how well you live it's also the quality and quantity of goods and services that a person can afford so that's a rough definition of standard of living the quality and quantity of goods and services that a person can afford that a person can consume so it's how much things you can afford the quality and quantity of what you can afford so it's more of a qual quantitative a qualitative qualitative measure of, of of how your life is you know your, your, your well-being how you, how you are so it's like how much houses you can afford the, the size of the house you can afford all right so some of the indicators for this one would be things like you know your the country's per capita income that's how much money each person in the country earns your living conditions if you're living in a small house a large house a medium house okay how much vehicles you have those kind of things how big screen tv you have standard of living you know compare all of these things so it's it's the quality and quantity of goods that you can utilize you can consume you can afford so that would be the definition for standard of living now b says state three factors that can be used to determine quality of life so what is quality of life quality of life is a more how should i put it it's a more qualitative measure of someone's well-being a more qualitative so you can't really put a dollar figure on the quality of life and so factors that can be used to determine the quality of life includes things such as let's go back here one let's go back here includes things such as you know birth rate death rate infant mortality life expectancy you know population product adult literacy you know civil liberties you know political rights and freedom so these are things you can use to determine someone's quality of life and the u.n normally use their human development index to try and measure these things the quality of life so these are what you can use to determine quality of life and on the other hand things like these you can use to determine standard of living you know living condition your per capita income a country's gdp you know how much money the country make the monetary value of goods that the country makes so if you look at the video i did on gdp versus gnp then that will help you a bit so you know standard of living quality of life what you can afford is a ram shack here it's a low standard of living like a lot of food you can afford good education access to health care those things help to measure your standard of living all right so that's that question in a nutshell right there 
All right, so we have some more here to indicators of standard of living. You have the quality and affordability of houses, uh, class disparity, you know, rich versus poor, the poverty rate, the income, equality, quality and availability of employment, number of vacation days per year. All these things are measure your standard of living. All right, so that's that question again, standard of living versus, you know, your quality of life. All right, so that would be that one. All right, see, describe two programs that ministries have could put in place to foster economic growth and development. All right, so the key thing here is Ministry of Education. So one time, they're, they're telling you right there that education is one of the engines that could foster economic growth and development. Education. So describe two programs that they can put in place. Okay, so you can go work crazy with this one. You can describe, you know, various training programs, you know, you know, you know, they can launch a program that can upgrade the skills of the current work, workforce so they can be more technologically suave, suave. You know, they can be more technologically inclined. Programs like that would help them to come into the new era, be able to produce better in these new modern times. So you can also put programs in place that would, you know, ensure that you know, grants and scholarships and stuff that would ensure that persons can access certain tertiary level education. A lot of ministries around the world actually do have grants and, you know, little scholarships for persons to encourage them to go to higher levels of learning. And that would in turn help to educate the human resource. And so when they come back now, they can use that knowledge to help to grow and develop the economy. So this thing is all about education and how education can be used to enhance the human resource within a, a country. So any, any program, training, education, skills, assessment, any program that the government put in place that would enhance education and knowledge would also go to enhance you know, development of the country, economic growth. So any program you can think of, use your country, see what your country have in place, and just write about that program. Like some countries have um, work, work programs where some of the youths would come on for about six a month or so, learn a trade, and then go off and do their own thing. So use whatever programs in the country that you have seen and write about that because, you know, CXC ain't living in your country, so they can't tell you a lie on that. All right, so that's what this one is all about. Just showing that education can lead to economic, an educated workforce can lead to economic growth and economic development. All right, the last question, I think. Yes, the last one. End of test. Last question. Identify, identify two methods that are used to measure a country's national income and explain how each method is used. Okay, so two, three methods you can think of. You have what you call, you know, GDP, you have GNP, and you have GDP per capita. Those methods can be used to measure, not calculate, measure a country's national income. Now, let's go with GDP per capita. Remember I said that per capita means, you know, whatever the total divided by the population so gdp is the gross domestic product or the monetary value of all the goods that have been produced within the borders of a country okay it's a monetary value so maybe they might say the gdp of trinidad might be let's say 10 trillion dollars that's how much the value of all the goods the monetary value of goods and services produced in trinidad so what they do now is divide that by the 1.3, 1.4 million people that, that live in Trinidad, and that's how you get the GDP per capita. So GDP per capita can be used to measure how much each person in the country should be earning. That's what GDP, GDP per capita is about. It tells you how much money each person in, give an idea of how much money each person in a country should be earning. So it's a rough, rough, rough estimate because they don't take into consideration children and people who are not working they just take the gdp divide it by the population and that's the number you get for that one and if you want to answer this one you can go back to the video i did on gdp and gnp and you'll be able to answer this one easily also you can use uh gnp which is gross national product what is this this is the monetary value of all goods and services produced by factors of production owned by citizens of a country for example, if you're living in Jamaica, all the goods produced in Jamaica, monetary value of the goods produced in Jamaica will be calculated. Those that are owned by foreigners will be subtracted and the 
value of goods produced by foreigners that are overseas will be added and that's how you get gnp okay that's how you get gnp that tells you how much the monetary value of all the production by factors owned by members of that economy members of that country okay for clearer understanding you can refer to my video on gdp versus gnp and that one and that would help you out with this one for sure okay so that's it for you know the 2017 may june pass paper again if you have any questions you can ask in the comment section and you know keep on top of it uh click the notification bell so that you can know when i drop the videos i don't know where i'm going to go next i might do one on finance or i might do one on the business plan i'm not too sure i might do a paper tree so i don't know which angle i'm going to come from but so keep noti click the notification bell and so you know when i drop something new